our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. So, I want to change that. Obviously, we can't just get straight into it. I'm going to explain how to see this started. The Biafra War was the second highest death toll in the whole of African history. During the Biafra War, over 2 million people died. That's men, children, and that's not even counting the soldiers as well too that lost their lives. And the untold stories of people that weren't accounted for that also died during this war. Nigeria got her independence in 1960, and the people could barely even get along within themselves, talk more of the way the country was divided. In all honesty, we never really asked to be together, making the North the majority and leaving Yoruba and Igbo people as the minority. The main ethnic groups in Nigeria are Igbo, Yorubas, and Hausa. We're very different in culture, in ideologies, even religious backgrounds. Yet, the British thought it would be a grand idea for Nigeria to be one. In 1914, Frederick Lugard decided that he would mesh Nigeria together, making Nigeria. The North were the less educated. Igbo people were too stubborn, and Yoruba people were not who they wanted to deal with. The British knew with working with the North that they could achieve the agenda that they had. Even before independence, the North was working hand in hand with the British in different things. The British would involve them in certain positions. Discussion of independence came along. It wasn't something that the British was excited about. Yet, they came to an agreement and said the only way they would allow Nigeria to be free was if they still allowed Nigeria to keep its same structure. Of course, with the desperation of these Southerners, they agreed. All they wanted was their freedom. To be quite honest, I don't think the young activists knew what they were getting into and didn't know the trap that they were walking into. Lagos race course is the scene and it's the afternoon of Nigeria's great day with thousands awaiting the climax and resolved to relish every minute leading up to it. The Queen's own words, she was to wish Nigeria a great and noble future. This was the moment for which the country's leaders in partnership with British authority had patiently worked. The Nigerians themselves emphasize that all has been done in friendship and that friendship will continue. Most people say that Nigeria wasn't ready for independence and actually don't agree. I believe it wasn't the fact that Nigeria wasn't ready for independence because who's not ready to be free? I think it was more so the fact that Nigerians didn't know the scheme that they were walking into with the North and the British people. They already had a whole plan planned out about how Nigeria would always be in favor of the North. Of course, we think people like Daja Wakchuku or Fumi Ransom could see the Fumi Ransom. <laughs> but I think they were so caught up in independence and thought they were getting independence that they didn't know they were signing up to be micromanaged, to be honest. One thing I've noticed, Premier, while I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have, I might almost call it, obsession about the Igbos. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't ten northerners in our civil service here. And I try to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. 
Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians a temporary or permanent one? In actual fact, what it is, is a northerner first. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it will be rather dangerous to see the number of boys we are now turning from our, all our learning institutions coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will uh, feel rather embarrassed and it might even lead to bloodshed. Doesn't this damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in, in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country? Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, uh, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in the east or in the west? The answer is no. And if there are, there may be 10 laborers employed only in the two regions. Of course, after independence, Igbo people started to roam around Nigeria. Igbo people were in Kanu, they were in Potaka, they were in different areas of Nigeria. It's just like any other place, the indigenous people are always going to feel like you're taking up their resources. Igbo people argue and say that when they went to these various states in Nigeria, they were just trying to make them their home. So most of them married the indigenous people, most of them started businesses, made their home those areas. But rising anti Igbo sentiment in the north that the chain of events that ultimately led to the civil war would begin to unfold. By as early as the year 1966, most Nigerians had already begun to resent the ruling elite for their lavish lifestyles and lack of sensitivity to the concerns of the masses. Rumors about vote rigging, corruption, and backdoor deals between politicians and foreign companies began to spread, and there was a general sense of discontentment in the air. The kickoff of the civil war happened in 1966, when Major Chukumanzog who started the first coup. Major Nziogwu, can you please give me an account of the night of the coup in Kaduna? Well, it's uh, rather something like the longest day. We started this off on the night of the 13th of January, uh, when a night exercise was planned by the military college, which I command. Uh, we took our troops to the ground and taught them how to do night attacks. We didn't tell them what we were planning for, but uh, at the end of the exercise, we took them out and showed them various places where they were to stand. The plan for the coup was to eliminate all of the prime ministers that were in power during that time. So that way, the citizens were left to be able to rebuild Nigeria the way they would like. Yet, it became suspicious because people like Namdi Azikiwe, who was the president, and Mike Opara, who was the prime minister for the Igbos, was out on vacation. Because of how suspicious it looked, the northerners were furious. The Igbo people started to get killed in the various places that they were, being that Igbos were everywhere, they were starting to kill them left and right. With that, they had a counter coup. With the counter coup, they were trying to take down Agui Ronzi because they thought he was also involved with this. The second coup was successful, putting Yakubu Guan into leadership and also Ojuku, who became the leader of Biafra. But yeah, today, Igbo people have started to be massacred in numbers. They were being killed everywhere. And this is when Ojuku finally called all the Igbo people and said that they should start coming back home. To leave everything they had and come back to the East. With that, rumors of Igbo people wanting to succeed started. And of course Nigeria didn't like that, so they decided to do a meeting. Juku rather settled the conflict outside of Nigeria ground, so they traveled to Ghana. That's where the Abui Accord was settled. That agreement, Ojuku brought several points that not only favored the Igbos, but favored Nigeria as a whole. The different things that Nigeria needed as a whole to function properly and to be able to have everybody, all the tribes, to be able to be functioning properly. Of course they came to conclusion and things seemed like it was great, but shortly after, Guan traveled back to Nigeria and mentioned things that had nothing to do with what they agreed. Let us not deceive ourselves that it was possible to solve all Nigeria's problems in the two-day meeting of minds of Nigeria's military leaders. I did say immediately after that conference that Nigeria will definitely remain united. I would never have said so if we went there to fall apart. Nigeria will remain one indivisible country by the will of the people of this country. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, my statement 
Your turn to shoot. No bullets. So on May 30th, 1967, Ojuku declared Biafra secession from Nigeria. And children of our kith and kin were taken out of their beds and slaughtered. They were massacred in places of worship, in the streets, in marketplaces, and in vehicles trying to carry them to safety. Of course they weren't going to let their oil leave them. Ojuku was nowhere prepared for a war, and neither was Biafra at the time. But Ojuku was ready for a fight, and so were the others. They were ready for their freedom. They didn't want to continue to be under there and be killed. To be honest, Biafra was like the only choice that Igbo people had. Did not secede at that time. I don't think much Igbo people would be alive today. That started, Igbo people were dying. They weren't winning the war at all because they weren't ready for it. Of course, they had different ammunitions flying in. Of course, other Western people definitely tried to help them out with the war. And Nigerians thought that they would back out, but Biafrans didn't. They continued. They continued to fight. They continued to want to keep pushing. So Nigeria's solution for that was to do some mega stuff. <laughs> Gowan decided to do a blockade, which starved the Igbo people. Most of their food came from the seas and overseas as well too. And so cutting off food and doing that blockade made people go into starvation. Just like any other genocides, the stories of these people have been silenced. There are untold stories. There are things that have just been swept under the rug and I think at this point Nigeria cannot sweep it under the rug anymore because history is literally repeating itself again. I have a childhood memory of Nigerian Biafra war. I lived in the township in Port Harcourt but this particular week my dad and I had traveled back home to visit. My uncle lives at home. And on this particular day, very clear memory of what happened, the particular event of this war. It, it was a war that I was hearing about, uh, but it came close and personal this particular day in the sense that it was a morning around 10 11 a.m morning bright day beautiful day and uh, i was on a bicycle escorting my uncle to a garden i guess i'll call it a garden or small farm um, around the corner. I left my house, my father's house, with my grandmother, my twin sisters, and um, my twin sisters were about maybe five, four, five years old. And um, as we rode out to the main road, out of the compound to the main road on a bicycle, we, I heard an explosion. An explosion. A bit far from where we were, from my location. And moment later, another Plan. So that was the first plane that I heard flew over, left a big explosion, and moments later, a second explosion came, and I could actually see the plane flying very low and unknown to me what was going on at that time. Uh, I could see that plane and I could see something drop from that plane because when the first one passed and we had an explosion we sort of stopped paused to see what that was but what we witnessed was the second one coming from behind and dropping what seemed like a big bomb 
But that explosion in that compound knocked me off my bicycle to the ground. And I took cover. I don't know what that, how it happened. I took cover under a, um, a tree. And um, until everything settled, it was, we went back to the house. Upon getting to the house, there was no more house. And this was my father's first house. He built that house. He had just completed it, furnished it. It was a brand new house. In that house, there was no more house. It was level. But in that house was my twin sisters my grandmother. For some reason, they were not completely leveled, but I'm gonna go with some, a little bit of detail here. One survived the injuries. The other one was cut on the stomach. And I could see as they held her, trying to patch her up, the intestines were out of the stomach. Nigerian Biafra War did not end there for me. Shortly after my compound was bombed, We had to run. It is clear to me that what my good friend turned bandit Gawan is planning there is purely to get a group of men round the oil terminal and then to shake the managers of the oil companies by the scruff of the neck and demand money. That's all. Of course, the westernized people tried to get involved, yet they weren't doing it for the right reasons. French got involved and supported and said that this was indeed a genocide, which it was, yet they weren't supported because they understand the Biafra people, but just because they knew that they would get some kind of gain if Biafra did successfully succeed. You're probably wondering, okay, why all this struggle? Why wouldn't they just let evil people go? Just like any other history, when a state wants to succeed, you're losing two things. One, the unity, and two, an asset. For Nigeria, that asset was oil. Protests went on all over the country, in London and in several other places, because they seen the things that were going on in Nigeria and how silent Nigerians were. There were two wars fought in Nigeria. The one, was the military war. The second was the propaganda war. Because after secession, Biafra was blockaded by air, land, and sea. White fathers, as they were called, the uh, Holy Ghost fathers, that I was introduced to the reality and the horror and the nightmare of Biafra. This child did not live the day out. We arrived to film this camp at Abulu at midday. There was a particular thing about Biafra, it was called Kwashioka. And this was the particular kind of malnutrition. And it was this inflated belly. And it was the haunted look in the eyes of babies. People died, as I have been saying, they died in huge numbers. I saw them die. I buried them. I was heartbroken again and again as I saw kids in the parish where I was working and knew the families. I saw them die. <laughs>
Juku was criticized for several reasons. He was criticized because they said that he was doing this for his selfish gain. He kept trying to push things knowing that his people were dying. People were dying, people were starving, and he just continued the war. General Guan banked on this, and he kept pushing in interviews and saying that Ojuku was the problem. Ojuku was the problem, and that's what fled everything. Because of how much publicity the war was getting, Western countries decided to support Nigeria and send them more ammunition to completely knock out the Biafrans. When rumors of this went out, Ojuku fled, which to me is very cowardly. On December 1969, Operation Tailwind, which was led by Olusegun Obasanjo, knocked out Igbo people completely. This led to January 1970, where Philip Effiong was left to just surrender Biafra. After the wars, Igbo people were homeless, they didn't have any money to their name. Wan went further to even decree an indigenous decree, making Igbo people sell their businesses to other Nigerian people because they weren't there. And people see this as a way to diminish Igbo people's wealth. Of course, there's other discussions we can get into on the Igbo and Yoruba beef and all these different types of things, but Igbo people were left to die, <laughs> honestly. There's no indication that they will ever get their homes back. How long is it that you and your people have lived here? We have been here more than 400 years ago. As long as that? Over 400 years ago. Do you have any other home at all? We haven't got any place, no home again than here, than Ikwere here. What do you think the local people want to do to you? Well, the people say they want to fight us. So because um, we ran away when there was a booming of gun during the civil war, See? And the army people protect them, not allow them to fight us. So you, the army at the moment is keeping you and them apart? Yeah, the army people are guiding us here. What would happen if the army left you alone? They said they will fought, uh, fight against us. They'll try and drive you out? Yes, sir. There were different things given to them, like 20 Nigerian pounds in their accounts, which did nothing for people that had businesses set up. But because they wanted their freedom, this is what they repaid the rebellious. <sighs> Nothing has really changed since then. Igbo people still want freedom. And surprisingly, some Yoruba people also want freedom as well too. The only people who truly show interest in Nigeria is the North because they're benefiting from it. Our school infrastructures are terrible and our protection is constantly in jeopardy. A problem that I see is we get so tied up in trying to get the Western world involved in our issues. And that's across Africa when we don't realize that they're only getting involved for monetary gain. They don't care about the people, they don't care about the suffering, they don't care about what freedom or what any kind of justice means to these people. We can have several arguments up and down. Evil people, Yoruba people, house people, we can argue from here to tomorrow, but one thing that doesn't lie is history. What's the solution for this? In my opinion, reconstruction. Now, of course, <laughs> Northerners would be afraid of this, and so many people have already given up on Nigeria, talk more of trying to get things involved. Organizations such as mine, Iruga, and Hope For Us Charity, Atide, these organizations want to bring change and they speak of the youth bringing this change, but how can the youth really bring change when we have all these policies put in place that literally block us and literally put a stop? The only real solution, like I mentioned, is reconstruction. 59 years, a bit too late, but better late than never. Overall, I think it's important to truly understand where Igbo people come from when the discussion of Biafra is had. I think it's important to really understand the people as a whole, and that's where real change can truly happen. I really do wish one day Nigeria can be one. I wish that we can really sit down and truly come to one with things. However, Nigeria was something that was forced on my people. That's my people in general. Hausa people, Yoruba people, Igbo people. It was forced. I am an Igbo woman before I'm a Nigerian. Why? Because Nigeria was not mine. mine. It was never something that I came up with. It was probably a kitchen discussion on what name they should name the black people. And to be quite honest, 
I love being Nigerian, but I can't sit here and identify that as my first thing. I'm an evil woman first before I'm Nigerian. My conversation to you is what steps can we take towards unity? Watching this and you're in power, what steps can we take towards unity? At this point with the division, that's why the country runs the way it does. That's why things are not making sense because it's built on lies and the blood of innocent people. I'm just making this video to let you know that there was a country. The kickoff of the war was in 1966 with me. Is that, is the mic recording? Is it coup or coup? I say coup. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> the kickoff of the war was in 1966 when Major Zogu. And what do I want to say about him? Because I don't want to talk too much. He had one bad mood. Um, what you are, Mara, you can marry no gay Biafra. So, I want to change that. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, English is my English, is my channel. I don't care. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm very proud of myself. I can't believe that I actually noticed them. Anyway, okay. So, waiting day, my order. My sweetie order. She just did, but.